Uh, Mike uh, Bergeron and I will kind of tag team back and forth on different topics uh, uh, that we'll go through. And I'll, I'll just start, you know, the, the highlights or the, the topics that we want to focus on is, uh, you know, video over IP or VOIP, but, you know, and we want to clarify, you know, what, what today's VOIP really is and uh, distinguish between that and streaming. Uh, then we'll talk about, you know, uh, proxy and networking uh, for field production and news gathering. Uh, just uh, different applications that are possible now with, uh, with low res and, and high res and streaming. Uh, and then we'll uh, talk about the uh, importance of when doing a live stream from the, from the field uh, to have a quality of service or a way to monitor the network and the bandwidth and, uh, you know, adjust accordingly. So we'll, we'll touch on that. Uh, and then we'll t look at some uh, other <clears throat> uh, associated, uh, I guess, video on IP relating to uh, PTZ cameras, uh, things like that. And then uh, we'll touch on what, what we're doing as far as VOIP. But I'll, I'll turn it uh, next slide to uh, Mike, if hey, you want to describe <clears throat> that one. Hi, uh, thanks. I'm uh, Mike Bergeron. I'm a business technology business development at Panasonic. And, and we have been doing a lot We've been building a lot of features into products with IP for the last really five years and just taking advantage of that and replacing, uh, and replacing a, lot of, uh, a lot of communication where we had been using serial protocols with IP. And um, as, it's been, as the, the uh, streaming video and the compression for the streaming video has become available to us, we started to add that to it. And so, what, so we're taking the same connections by having IP address on all these cameras and we're using that to stream out and we're streaming out from camcorders and from um, and from the from the PTZ cameras in addition to having control now when you're doing that it's a it's a, a streaming video and we're using our RTSP and that's that's going to be a uh, that's going to tend to have some that's tend to be kind of high latency it's going to be Fairly, it's going to be fairly heavily compressed. It's a good way to move video around. It's maybe uh, fast enough for a, a conversation, for an interview, or for a remote. It's good for a remote, but um, you're not going to. And, and also, it'll fit in a gigabit Ethernet, so you can use regular Cat6 cable. Um, what we've been hearing a lot of discussion, if you're at NAB this year or in and around it, is is VOIP, video over IP. Uh, not to be confused with voice over IP, which, which uh, I think was the original owner of that acronym, although voice over IP is really the, the rule rather than the exception now, so it's really, um, you don't hear about voice over IP. But uh, the VOIP, for the broadcast industry, when they talk about, uh, when they, when they talk about infrastructure, it really comes from the idea that a, the difference between a video router and a off-the-shelf internet router is is all the IOs, you know, all the HDSDI ports versus just internet ports. The difference between a video server and a regular off-the-shelf server is all the is all the IO all the IO cards getting those SDI in. So if you don't need those, all that gear can get a lot less expensive, and also you get the the flexibility of it. But in order to replace in order to replace your uh, HDSDI infrastructure with, with IP, um, it needs to be very, very low latency, needs to have auto discovery so you can find it, and, um, and that's what video over IP is. And also, just, um, because it, just to avoid confusion, it's, it's going to be on a 10 gigabit Ethernet because it's uncompressed in HD usually. So, so, that's, so, we're, so we're really, we're talking about uh, multi-mode fiber versus Cat6, so it's a whole a whole different world. And your video over IP, Chuck's here, so I'll, I'll mention the uh, Aspen Group is is there, and other uh, other protocols like TRO3, and that that's all the VOIP. And uh, I also mentioned NDI because I think it's sort of in between. Um, it is it's heavily compressed like streaming, but it's fairly low latency, and it'll go on a gigabit Ethernet. That is kind of a new idea, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very big in, in a lot of segments of the market, but that's really kind of in its infancies. So um, the first thing we're going to get into is some of the flexibility and, and the different kind of problem solving we can do with streaming video and, and just having IP connectivity. 
<clears throat> okay, and um, but the, some background for that gets into um, how you're going to compress. I mean, when you're you're doing streaming, you're going to be doing compression. We people just tend to refer to streaming as H.264. Um, we uh, we have been doing H.264 for quite a while now. It's it's basically in just about everything we do. Um, but we can also use the IP for control, and that was the first thing we did, as I mentioned before. We replaced most of our serial controls with IP controls, and uh, one, of the, one of the big benefits for us <coughs> there was now we can have the same control protocols on the camcorders, on the studio cameras, on the pan tilts, and so you can put them all in the same network and use the same types of controllers. And uh, that's just an, another benefit that popped up along the way. That and taking all the guys from two different factories and putting them in the same building, but that's got nothing to do with technology. <laughs> okay, and, um, and what we did to get the streaming out of the camcorders was because we were already doing a low res, uh, a, a low res compression for proxy video, we can use that same encoder to do the streaming. And, um, and then we get to the discussions we've had with our uh, with the guys doing backpacks, live view, TV view networks, Degero, um, where they're doing a QoS streaming, and um, what what our customer, what what people have been asking us is really they want that to live in the camera, and so the encoders we have are powerful enough that we can get that in there too, and that's that's uh, and we're, we're going to talk about that. But once you've done all that, and you know and you have your decoders out there, which can be a web browser, then then you can start to introduce a lot more new features. And Rick's just gonna. And I'm gonna. I'm gonna do this one over to Rick, and we'll just talk yeah. about the. I mean, I'll say the these. We started out with ABC Ultra as just like a high quality Kodak, and we won like a Hollywood Post Alliance award for being able to do 10 bit 422 in a in a camcorder. We were the first guys to do that with this. But um, I, I. But it's where it's become interesting on streaming is on the other direction. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So like Mike said, uh, and we. A lot of you have seen this slide before, uh, just with the different types of codecs and compression. So a couple of quick points on these new codecs, uh, and you see the circle around the more efficient news gathering, is that uh, we've taken a, a AVC Entra intra frame encoding and gone to a long op structure, uh, which uh, is a four to one improvement of that compression from the past. So uh, I mean, the efficiencies are much better now and so we can get uh, you know broadcast quality pictures uh, uh, you know down around 12 megabits per second or 25 so that's that's step one but really important in red is the proxies and uh, so with proxies uh, the, the <clears throat> next slide Go on. there so so the engine inside the cameras now what they what, what that engine does uh, is able to it's a dual codec so you're able to uh, stream or not stream but uh, record high res so you have a whole range of your high res content to choose from but simultaneous is going to create a proxy video so it's either going to be a proxy file that's going to go on the on the uh, disk or we'll get into uh, QoS streaming so just, just want to point out that dual Kodak capability now with uh, most of the new or modern uh, cameras. And it really is just a, a reflection of the, the increasing power of the LSI chips, and not just ours, everybody's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, uh, just uh, we're going to take a few uh, minutes here to focus on the, more of the field production, news gathering, and uh, you know, over uh, network connectivity, wireless, uh, <laughs> Uh, next generation sensors, uh, we won't really get into that, but um, uh, if you go to the next. So uh, one key point is, uh, you know, all the new camcorders, cameras, even uh, field recorders and players have, uh, have a LAN port. So uh, that's, that's step one for hardwire LAN. Um, but we're also uh, <coughs> built into these cameras, and you can look later, is, uh, is a USB port and a compartment. So uh, one is you can put a Wi-Fi module inside that, uh, that port, which is inside the camera, so it's protected. Uh, and we've, we've recently uh, developed one that's a dual band. Of course, you know, in certain environments, having a 5 gig band uh, as well as 2.4 is, is very useful. But that same USB port could also uh, mount a, uh, a Verizon antenna, for example, a 4G LTE antenna. Uh, would go into that, not that the port, but it would mount uh, on the side of the camera. 
So, but the uh, the real key to what it, you know those, that connectivity there is really uh, you know from the left side is to be connected somehow to the internet. So, you know that's the first step. Uh, that you've got these different ways to connect, whether it's a Wi-Fi into a MiFi or a, a Wi-Fi into a router or a, you know these different methods. But once you're connected now, the, uh, <clears throat> you, you see a whole slew of applications that we'll touch on that are possible back to the camera or from the camera. So uh, one is, uh, it's not shown here, but control, and I'll touch on that, just being able to reach out to the camera and control iris or paint and shade, auto white balance, things like that, or white balance. Uh, but then there's uh, file transfer workflows or applications using a FTP type of uh, um, uh, function and we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, part of file transfer is uh, what, what we call P2CAS and now we're going to talk about cloud applications, you know, being connected from the camera, uh, back at the station or anywhere uh, and we'll, we'll touch, you know, the camera in different ways. Uh, so that's file transfer and then uh, the cameras, as I mentioned before, you can go into a streaming mode so the camera will then uh, take that engine and stream and try to achieve the highest bit rate possible based on the bandwidth. Uh, but there's different applications. So uh, Mike mentioned Live View, for example. Uh, you know, to do that QoS or that quality of service, Live View has uh, implemented that algorithm into, the, into their server. Uh, but we've also developed some uh, uh, capabilities to, to grab that stream, provide a QoS, and we'll uh, We'll, we'll touch on that later. Right, so this is just a, an example of controlling the camera. So again, if you're connected, <clears throat> and you could, this could be uh, the, the studio camera in-house, could be a PTZ camera, uh, some kind of a field recorder or camcorder. Once it's connected, you can de uh, deploy different applications. So for example, you see an HR or a ROP on the left side. That's something typically that would be used to paint and shade studio cameras. Uh, but now, because those are IP capable, uh, from a single panel like that, you can connect up to 99 different devices or cameras and then, you know, paint and shade and match uh, and uh, work it that way. So, um, I'll go through the P2Cast. So, <clears throat> so we mentioned uh, P2Cast. Uh, so, this is a... Uh, a, a We'd, it's been introduced about a year ago, and the idea is that, that it is kind of a cloud server, but it's really just dealing with proxy at this point. So we'll talk about the high res and how we get that back directly to the station without, you know, worrying about security. But, you know, it's, it's secure in, in the way it is. But with P2Cast, from uh, the station point of view or control point, you know, we'll talk about putting metadata from station into the cameras. We talk about uh, capturing... Uh, uh, the proxy videos as they're being shot and uh, the photographer cameraman doesn't have to do a thing it's all now sort of automated so it's uh, something that's really uh, growing a lot of interest because as we talk more about this we become media less in the cameras you know the ability to actually bring your high-res content back through a, a file transfer without having to pull the media you know bring it all the way back to the station is, is now possible so so the, uh, the user interface, and I'll, I'll just spend a minute here to, to describe what, what's happening. Uh, I was hoping to actually demonstrate that, uh, where we have a camcorder that has a, it's a Verizon uh, 4G LTE network, but they don't have Verizon in this room. It's, it's an AT&T building, so we, <clears throat> we messed up on, the, on that one. So uh, what happens though is you can be out shooting clips, right? It could be not just <coughs> one camera, but you know, a whole uh, crew could be out on different projects, uh, different locations, uh, and they would be categorized in a, in a group or a, uh, you know, there's different functions there. But as they're shooting, <coughs> you'll see uh, the, the clips will start to pop up in this field here. So the, and these are all proxies, right, from, from the camera. And you have a whole range of proxy choices when, you, when you're out shooting. You can, go to a, a, I think, 800 kilobit proxy up to a 6 megabit proxy, which is a full 1080 by 1920 um, raster. And it's, you know, using long gop, it's really a, a nice picture. But I just mentioned that because later on, you can just grab the proxy right away and put it to air if you had to. But the idea is, so these clips are uh, popping up uh, quickly. And again, the photographer is just shooting, uh, doesn't have to stop. 
But you know, each one of these clips you can drop over into a viewer, right? And you can view the clips. Uh, but the real key point here is that you, you, you see the, the clip, it could be an hour long clip, it might be you know, a half hour long clip or even longer. But as you're, uh, whoever is viewing, maybe you just need a two minute sound bite uh, at, you know, at some point or just a five minute interview that's, that's there. So you drop it here, you can uh, mark an in point and an out point, right? So it's simple editing. Uh, you can drop that clip then or that mark into a, a playlist. Uh, you can grab another clip and do the same thing, right? Just drop it in, heads and tails, or just one. But so, so the real point here, you, you create that playlist, uh, you submit it, and it goes back to the camera. It creates an EDL, so it's an a EDL that goes to the camera, and so inside the camera, and this is all automatic, uh, the, the photographer doesn't have to do anything, it will conform the high res that's on the media into those bits that you edited there. It then creates a new clip, uh, high res, uh, onto the media, and now you can initiate uh, an FTP call. So now the camera, and again, this, this can all happen in the background, uh, if you do lose a connection, it'll pick up where it left off when you reconnect. But the high res then can be uh, directed to transfer directly back to an FTP server at the station. So it's a, it's a really nice high speed uh, or faster way to get content shortened and then back to the station for air. So that, that's the general concept of, of P2 cast or the ability to take advantage of the proxy proxy edit. Uh, you could, if you see something that's really important, right from this user interface, download the proxy, uh, and then just, it's a .mov file at that point, so you can just drop that into your server or most servers and play it out, so it's a, a real quick way. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, these are some of the new things. Uh, I'll just add that we're, we're putting into that basic workflow or that, that, that ability to connect to the camera. Um, one is, uh, if you're out in the field, uh, you'll have a, a list of cameras that are registered into this uh, application. Uh, and then you'll have your photographers who will have a profile. So they, when they take a camera, they put their SD card in here and it cr creates a profile. So now, so now we can see who, for example, has what camera. Uh, and you'll be able to tell if the camera is connected. This is all back at the station, so you'll be able to see if they're online. <coughs> the model of the camera, whether or not they're recording. <coughs> this is always a bad indicator when you see their battery is about to, to go dead, so you don't want to, you might call them up and tell them, but uh, I'm sure they'll know. So the, uh, the other part to, to keep in mind is that uh, these new cameras, again, uh, we talk about you know, these, these networks, but they all have GPS built into them now. So uh, these, with uh, taking advantage of the, the GPS, it's possible to uh, kind of take that same information we were talking about with the camera and put it up on a map so now you can get an idea of where, where they're at uh, shooting those clips. You know, it's a little bit of a big brother situation. Well, but, think uh, it's like Uber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's one aspect is to get a location, but, but also um, uh, you can create a map search. So if you have a lot of people out there in the field and you're getting a lot of clips in like that user interface, you know, it might, <clears throat> you, you can search those clips and pull them up. You'll get a thumbnail that uh, is, is of the last clip that that photographer shot and it'll put it on a map as to where it was shot. And so it's, you know, tying a lot of this uh, all together. So, <clears throat> so in, in any case, this is something new as part of that interface that, you know, first of all, you can be sitting back at the station at ingest, uh, uh, but now you can also have the same access or application if you want to, uh, to view files and clips that's going on in a project uh, from either an iPad or a, uh, a smartphone. All right, if you just, uh, I'm run this yeah, I just want to talk it. about it first. Okay. So again, that was, uh, you know, that was a Panasonic application that's uh, taking advantage of networking. So the, the, the next key step is to take that networking interface, uh, you know, past a firewall and into the, uh, into the newsroom or the, new, or the station. 
So whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's an Avid or, uh, you know, an Apple type editing, Adobe, uh, the, the P2Cast bridge is, is kind of linking those, that work flow that we just talked about back to the, uh, to the newsroom computer system. So this Play. is a, a little animation yeah. that somebody made. But the uh, first point is you create a story, right? You have a news story and you create slugs and metadata. So the metadata goes through the, through the application out to the cameras to a specific camera. So now when they're going to start this project, they'll have all the metadata you know, on the media as it happens. Could be a story ID. Right, and then the uh, EDL that we talked about uh, is now possible with that, the proxy from different editors. And the idea is, you know, the same as we talked about, is to send that EDL of a, of a long clip and uh, be able to cut that down high res wise in the camera, right? And then, uh, then FTP back to your server so that we can get it to the, to the playout server. So that's, you know, again, just tying networking uh, through without having the, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, um, things. So I'm going to uh, <clears throat> switch over to Mike now, and I'm okay. Gonna just, uh, all right. All right. So in addition to, and this was actually something that we found when we when we brought this FTP thing out to out to uh, to, to show to people, they were all like, "Well, yeah, that's fine." But what what we really want is, can you stream directly? Can you stream directly from the cameras? And then. It shouldn't have been a surprise that that was what, what people were asking for because it was maybe five or six years ago when I first started talking to guys at, at uh, DeGero and the Live View and TVU and uh, there's another one I'm forgetting. Well, there's probably two more I'm forgetting. And Teradek Bond even. Um, where where um, you know, it just became normal to have these backpacks with, and it, this was like when 3G was still pretty rare. Um, and you'd have a backpack with a half a dozen air cards in it and an encoder to uh, you know to get you a link back you know in either a place where you couldn't do satellite or microwave or where you were just trying to do it for less money and there were there were two pieces of technology that made those work <coughs> one was the the bonding where you're taking the where you're taking the multiple cards and lashing them together which was extremely important with the networks as they were now less so now um, but the other was the was the QoS streaming. It, all of those guys were looking at for each channel. They were looking at the network conditions and throttling the bandwidth of the compression based on the available based on the availability of, of the channel. And so when when we were asked to do, can you please do a direct streaming? We we have the you know the secondary compression in here on that on the same chip that's doing the recording and as it turns out we can you know we can we can tweak that on the fly pretty quickly and can do can do QoS streaming so so what we what we what we're doing there is we're doing forward error correction we are um, estimating we're doing um, very high high speed pinging on the network to, to see where it's going and then we're Throttling the throttling the data rate um, very quickly as we go, and then we have a special decoder on the other end that's accounting for the the uh, the variable bit rate. So one of the things that's if if you can't if if you can't estimate the the bandwidth quickly, then you're gonna you're gonna overshoot on your increases and decreases in bandwidth. So we, we're doing the um, in the the wireless binomial congestion control and the lost inferential algorithm that allows you to do a much uh, quicker response and also look ahead to where the where the bandwidth is going rather than just where it is and um, and 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 that we were able to follow we're able to follow those changes fairly quickly and if you see this graphic here is uh, showing some data of where the um, the actual codec rate is in the is in the light green the dark rate is the rate we estimate that the network is doing, and the gray is what the actual network is, where, where the actual network is. And of course, we're being conservative, we're going below that, but we're following the network conditions fairly quickly um, you know, as we go along, you know, as, as, as we uh, go around. And you put that together with the forward error correction, and we can get, we can get a very, very good signal at uh, six megabits. Um, with the forward error correction, 
Um, we're able to do that at, uh, we max out around six megabits, but uh, even, even below that, we'll still get a, a pretty good picture. You have adjustments in, in the camera where you can maximize it for uh, robustness, for just perform, picture performance, or for low, low latency, depending on, your, uh, depending on the conditions and depending on what you're doing. If you're trying to do an interview with somebody, obviously you want to keep the latency as low as possible. And if this really drops really low in bandwidth, um, it will, the, the last thing to go will be audio. So you'll always try to preserve audio. Now, we have a piece of software um, that, we will, that you can load on a server if you want to catch these things, you want to set up your own FTP server. And um, a lot of people didn't want to do that. Um, they, and so we have right here, we basically created our own, our own uh, decoder server to take this. And one of the nice things about it is it could do pages and pages of cameras, hundreds of cameras. All, all can be connected to the server at the same time. And then you just select, on the, there's a two output version and a four output one, and you just select two of those, or four of those, and those are coming live out of the SDI. So, I mean, it's, it's not a, like a, a sync switch or anything like that, but, but you can have, say, four, four look, if you've, got, if you've got 50 cameras out in the field, you can see every one of them, and it's updating, it's updating every couple of seconds. So you're seeing in the thumbnail what it is on every, every one that's connected. But you drag one of those over to one of the SDI outputs, and boom, now you get the live output from that server, from that, from that camera. Now, uh, we showed this to a bunch of people, and the first thing we asked was, oh, could we also use that for a decoder for the, for the pan tilts? Because everybody has those. And by the way, it's using a similar RTSP algorithm. So I can connect my camcorders out in the field, and I can connect my PTZs if I got them up on traffic cams or things like that, and run them all on the same server. It makes it a lot easier. Actually, even easier than that, if you, if you uh, happen to have a, a uh, if you're using a live view, we, uh, we had them load the live view, we had them load our decoder in the live view server, so you can treat this camera just like it's, a, it's another backpack. It's not can, the same bandwidth. We can show them, actually. I've got yeah. the, uh, on the <clears throat> So yeah, we're running one of the first, I mean, these are just coming, this is just the lab one that we, we grabbed out of here. And um, you know, we were in here just right. seeing how much we can do with there. Um, and he's just so, going through, you're just going through Wi-Fi? Uh, this yeah. is Wi-Fi at this point, yeah, directly from the camera. So it's uh, you know, just part of the stream. We, <clears throat> we have it set up here just so, uh, so we can see that, but. Uh. Not directly to YouTube, and that's just a protocol issue. Um, for YouTube, you need to have, uh, well, well, YouTube or live stream or Ustream or any, um, we all stream. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, um, that needs, they, they need RTMP streaming. RTMP is kind of a push, is sort of a push streaming, and we're using RTSP streaming, which is generally a, a pull stream. Um, what you could do is uh, go to a, uh, to a streaming engine, I could come from here into a uh, like a Wowza streaming engine or a Wirecast, and then I could I could pump to send that up to pretty much any anybody who's uh, streaming from there. Okay, ah, so like well, for an a, a adaptive bitrate, now we just, you need something like Dash, like. Uh, so, so basically, like, you could take that camera and just have it go straight to YouTube. You could take, send it back to your station and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we'd have to we'd have to repack it. So <clears throat> there, it is a there is possibility to go to a, a fixed bit rate out of the camera, so that we're not using the QoS. Uh, you need a good connection for that, but that's RTP RTSP. So <clears throat> that could go directly, uh, but I'm not. It still have to. Well, I mean, if you've got a streaming, actually, what you could do is um, you you could connect it in the fixed bit rate. You could connect it directly to. Um, a uh, Wowza cloud cloud service, and you can and you can connect it to there, and then they will, and then they'll hop it, and then they can hop it to YouTube or anybody else. Right, right. We're trying to eliminate that, that 
Right, right. It's a question of us implementing the RTMP protocol, which, which, is, uh, which is a very, very uh, popular topic of conversation uh, right now, is where we want to add we want to add the RTMP protocol so that you can use so that you can do what the what the Teradek does because that that's a push protocol, right. so it'll send and that that's what all the CDNs need. That's what uh, the only guys that'll take RTSP or wire, Wirecast and Wowza, and then they'll flip it to RTMP and send it up. So it's 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 an additional hop, but uh, it is definitely uh, it is definitely on the roadmap to get to RTMP. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, in fact, we are in uh, on this server. You can use that monitor. I can go to a. Uh, I can change. Like right now, it's streaming, so I'm looking at at output. But if I if I if I flip that to camera control, then now I've got pan tilt of a pan tilt camera. I can have um, I can I can get zoom and iris and things like that on a on a camcorder so that there's a uh, depending on what camera I'm connected to I can I can get camera control from the same interface. Oh, intercom? Mm, no, not yet. No, not intercom. It's not a lot of data we could do. We could implement it, but that's again it's 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 one that's come up. It's, it's come up quite a bit. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, well, it, uh, 265 is going to involve a, a new, a new uh, LSI. We've got to get to a more powerful uh, chip before we can do 265. So, I mean, it's, it's, it was, we had to wait until this chip was made before we could implement 264. And in fact, the first implementations, it was a board with like five chips on it for the first couple of uh, cards until we got it all down to one chip. That's why we can do them. And these used to only be shoulder mount cameras. Uh, 265, it's probably like one or two more generations of chip before we can do 265. But 265 really gains you more uh, the higher your, your resolution. Where 265 makes the biggest difference on the on the biggest frame. So, like on in 4K, 265 is a really huge gain. In, in HD, it's not as much. But uh, but yeah, I mean that that is the one when we can process that. But we'll we'll uh, we'll do to 265. Right now, that's mostly like contribution, like running on servers and things. All right. <laughs> Okay, so, and this is what we were showing you. So we've got uh, 20 cameras per page, uh, four outputs, camera control, um, just, just running on, on that server if you're using our server. Uh, I'll just point out uh, one of the key things with this particular user interface and what we're doing with streaming, uh, as Mike mentioned, whether it's PTZ cameras or uh, cameras out in the field, up to a uh, a thousand cameras but you see the thumbnails you actually can see the pictures of those cameras even the ones in the field will uh, will be a thumbnail that updates every uh, minute or so just again if you can imagine you know monitoring thousands of cameras just over a simple network uh, that's possible with this lower res uh, proxy type right it's just sending flow. stills yeah. sending periodic stills. so if somebody's got the camera up on sticks you know where they are you know what they're shooting and um, also another another thing about that, to get uh, connectivity with using a, using an air card or, or something from from this camera or anything else, to be able to map it to that server, I need to have a global IP, and this is true for the backpacks as well. And the cards with the global IP address are are quite a bit more expensive be, because of the global IP address. They'd rather just have a uh, you know, a uh, variable IP or a dynamic IP. Um, what, one of the things we can do with the, this, we're doing this on the same server that we're doing the P2 cast, is uh, the, the cloud service that you subscribe to will manage all your port forwarding between the camera and the server.
So you don't need to have a global IP, you just, when you, when you load the profile into the camera, it knows who that profile is, what that IP address is that needs to go back to the server, and it will, it will port forward whatever dynamic IP address the camera got was assigned by the network, and it will pretend it's a global IP and send it back in, so you don't, you don't need to manage all those IP, all those IP addresses. Okay, now moving on to a also, yes? I believe it's V4, but I don't know. Yeah, because V6 is that can move around and still. Perhaps it's, I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. I imagine you could. Um, in general, <clears throat> I, mean, I can't think of a reason anything that would stop you. I don't know how to, but like if you, it would probably slow it down. It's probably gonna, you're, it's probably gonna adversely affect your bandwidth. Um, all right. So, in the the Pantel cameras. Those have been connected to IP for years now. And there was actually a streaming out of there uh, that we inherited from the security, from security cameras, which only do streaming out. And we started out by putting a streaming out just so you could have it as a preview. So if you were using a camera controller, you don't have to run a, a coax out to the controller, um, you know, just get another cable out there they can get a streaming just to see where they're shooting with it, with a, with a preview. So what we did was, again, as the chips got better, we were able to get to the same kind of H.264 streaming, RTSP again, not RTMP, sorry, um, and uh, more or less the same protocol. We were using that to stream, and this is popular where we would just send this uh, to a Teradek decoder or a Matrox decoder, and people would use that to run a traffic cam back. Uh, so first thing when we showed people the the server to decode the camcorders is that well can we also decode the PTZs from there and it's like actually it wasn't a big deal to do and so um, because it's more or less the same codec and the proto stack, protocol stack is very similar although there's no QoS because it's generally a fixed installation so we're we have the same sort of thing where we have connectivity for control and we have streaming out from the camera and so we can start to implement a lot of the same features in there that can, we did with the... Uh, I can go into that? Oh, yeah, that please, go into that. And what that really... About one of the things that that does, you know, if, if, you're a, if you're in the AV business or you're just putting a studio together for, uh, for a webcast in a, in a school or, or uh, just for distance learning, um, this means that if I'm, if I'm using... I mean, I've got video and audio baseband, of course, I've got control on IP, and I've got and I've got power. I've got to put a, a, I've got to put 12 volts in there. Um, if I don't, if I can use the streaming video, all I need to do is get rid of the power, and I can get this down to one cable. And luckily, uh, power over Ethernet came along, and PoE Plus, which is enough power to to run these cameras. So we're now doing PoE Plus with these cameras. You'll you'll notice there's no power supplies near, near any of these cameras. We're all running them off of the same PoE plus switch. So really, you're, you've almost got like a SMPTE 311 here running in, a, running in a CAT6 if you use it in that kind of application. Well, now I wanna, <clears throat> I'll talk to this one. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the a couple of points here, you know, we talk about the, uh, the, the encoder built into the camera. It's H.264. But it's not just uh, one stream that you can extract from these cameras now. You can actually get up to four streams. So, uh, you know, you can go up to, uh, actually, there's, I don't think there's any decoders that can do 24 megabits of a decode, but it's possible to take, you know, much higher resolution, higher bit rates. But now you can start to map it out to stream to, uh, to the web or to the uh, YouTube or, you know, different types of applications. Uh, but uh, also important, and that's we're going to show you some applications here. We can get a real low-res type proxy uh, stream as well. That's all, all associated with the IP address of that camera. So it's uh, important to know that you can extract high-res 
but used the low res for, for various applications. Uh, and so uh, one application <clears throat> that we'll, uh, we'll pass this around, but uh, we've got a, uh, it's called tap and go. And uh, uh, if Mike, you'll point out, you'll see this okay. camera set up over here <clears throat> has a- Right, has the a, camera just attaches on the top here. Right, and then uh, below it is a uh, base camera. It's just a, you know, a simple kind of a wide angle camera that, uh, that's there and uh, provides same idea streaming. So what, and I'll pass this around, the idea is uh, with an, uh, an iPad app, for example, uh, we're picking up the, the video from, uh, from the Wi-Fi here. You know, it's able to do that and show you the wide angle camera here, which is you know, covering all of us in this event, uh, and then the high res camera on top, which actually is that one right there. So the point is on the bottom you can just touch and go to the, uh, <clears throat> to the high res or even frame it up. You know, if you need a certain focus or zoom, you can do the, you know, the simple pinch and zoom and track. So it's uh, pretty, pretty versatile and uh, uh, again using that kind of low res. But I'll, I'll pass that around as we uh, as we talk, I mean, is there any, right. anything the, more you want to? And the baseband out is just coming out of here into the switcher. And uh, this just becomes an alternative controller where you may have a joystick controller on the same network, but maybe you have this one too. And it, uh, it could be something that you give to a presenter if they want to have an audience camera like we have now, and there's a question there and I want to, and I want to send it over there. It's really uh, much less of a learning curve to use this than to, uh, than, than to operate a joystick also. It's, we, uh, we actually did a, uh, a live webcast from the floor of NAB um, with, with LiveView, uh, LiveView and, uh, Live and NewTek. And they had a thing, a booth set up and there were two, two uh, hosts and they were just having people come and sit with interviews for them. And they had a, they had a couple of these and then a manned camera up front. And then up above them, there was a uh, product cam. So, you know, guys were coming in, they were showing them their new widget, and they would, and the, the host of the show would, would direct the camera using the iPad to, uh, you know, to point at the, the thing we're getting in. And I realize I'm in QVC right now. So, Eric, yeah, I should actually. Ideal. Uh, ideal I did, QVC. that was not on purpose. <laughs> 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 right, but anyway, they were using that as a, as a product cam just to, just to point things around like that. And there's all kinds of things like that. It's an audience cam or a product cam. I mean, it, it's just because you have that video stream and the control on the same on the same connection. There's there's more things you can do, which actually gets into the other one. I want to try that? Okay. Um, another thing we can do, since we're getting a video stream and controller all going to the same place, we can uh, we can do an auto tracking just by using just by running software on a PC. And I'm gonna to go to my blank screen so we can see if that, so we can get this to work. And, if that's and you'll, uh, you'll see the user interface on this monitor here. I'm just launching the program. Um, and it's all, uh, again, taking advantage of the stream over right. the IP on a simple PC or laptop server. There's a little bit of latency there. Well, actually. But uh, you simply uh, click, and before you move, Mike, let me turn it on. All right. So. So here, right, and so, hopefully that's going to follow. So you see it picks up, and, and I'll explain something later, but right now uh, what you're seeing is it's more of an object-based type of tracking, but you can, should right. track them, so if you... Yeah, it's following me, okay. And and so this further. follows me around. And you'll see the camera in the, right. in the center there tracking. Like Tony Stark's robot. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, and um, we just... Uh, the, keep putting out new versions of this because the, what, we're, what we're finding in, in terms of schools and uh, universities and the conference rooms and things like that, everybody agrees they want one of these that works. They, there's a lot of them that don't work already, which is fine. Actually, but, yeah. um, <clears throat> it, it's, uh, we're, we're the latest version, we're also putting uh, face recognition into it so that it will be able to keep track of of the yeah. person. <clears throat> and and uh, yeah, is, just a comment. Yeah, I don't know if this is the version that remembers <coughs> me when I turn around. <clears throat> it does. <clears throat> but this, uh, we, we showed it at NAB, this uh, from our Panasonic security division has, uh, you know, they do things uh, in facial recognition, things like that. So we have uh, the, or the, the technology and, 
it's just amazing. And I, I unfortunately can't show you here, but the idea is in the same user interface, you, uh, you pick them and then you kind of take a picture, if you will, or you, know, you just take a snapshot. So now it has that facial information as, a, as an object or is stored in there. So you can do that with different people. But it's, it allows you to uh, actually go off camera and then come back in and it picks you up. And it's, it's pretty uh, kind of scary, but it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. All right. Now another thing, and, and we kind of went back and forth about whether we wanted to put this into the presentation or not, because this is really about IP and that streaming. Um, but I was, I was at um, Streaming Media East, which is a show dedicated to, to streaming delivery and streaming applications and things like that. It was in, uh, in New York this yesterday, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and everybody there was talking about stream, was talking about VR 360. The reason why is that's the only way to deliver it. If you're going to do a VR 360 and you're going to deliver it to people, you're going to stream it. So, what uh, what it what it's doing? I mean, and this is just this is our prototype that we're working on because, not surprisingly, we we want to get into that game. Um, and what we're doing here is it's four 4K cameras for wide angle 4K cameras that covers the whole sphere around it, 360, 360 degrees. And then you, you take that and you map the sphere to a rectangle the same way a globe maps a map onto a rectangle. It's basically the same algorithm. And then once you've done that, you can send the signal over a regular video pipe. So if I am, if, if there's a 4K streaming that's coming in and you go to a website to find it and everything, it's mapped however many cameras they've stitched together onto a, a 4K stream and, um, and, you, and then you stream that 4K. The viewer then does the reverse and lets you move the, move the device around so you can look up, up around and, um, and up and down. So the, the infrastructure to deliver uh, VR 360 is just existing HD or 4K streaming as it is now. That's why you're seeing so much of it appearing so quickly. And you create it just by stitching, stitching pictures together. And, um, and then it's a question of like how clever you want to get with the, with the actual viewers. And I mean, that could be as simple as just a square where you can just, you know, use the, use the arrows to point it around if you use like the VR viewer that's on uh, YouTube. So, so that's the idea. If I already have a 4K stream or an HD stream, I can just, I can use my, uh, I can use my camera, um, match the cameras. I mean, and what, what we're looking to do with this prototype is all the, all the pictures are uh, pre-matched and they're all, they're all balanced and we've flare compensated. And then you stitch that and stream it out live, send that up to a, to a, to a Wowza, or a, if we get RTMP on there, which is my hope, then we could send that directly to YouTube, and then it goes right to all those crazy VR 360 players. So again, it's really an, another application of, of streaming, is something like VR, uh, we can immediately get that distributed and, um, and start to get that to people, which was, which was one, of the, one of the many problems with 3D, is that there was no good distribution system for it right off the bat. I mean, we started to come up with something, but, but it, was by, it was too late by the time we had it. With VR, one of the advantages it has is the infrastructure for it is already in place. And in fact, yeah, with a, with a, we did a test with Raza where you could just do that. So if, like, let's say we had this camera at the end of the year or maybe early next year, <laughs> We would, you'd be able to deliver, uh, you know, live streaming from it pretty much day one. And so, once again, with all that, everything there is all just streaming video and just otherwise taking advantage of internet connectivity, as opposed to video over IP, which is low latency, has uh, auto discovery, you can synchronize it, and it's baseband, it's uncompressed, except for the 4K. Now, what Panasonic has been doing with that is 
we did join uh, the Ames Alliance, and what the Ames Alliance was was basically we all agree, everybody who joined this, that we all we all agree that um, when we when we pick a protocol that we like, we're going to all support it, and um, and you know we'll wait and see, and then when we get one that's standardized and everybody likes it, then then we'll all support it. And that's what the Ames Alliance is. It's not actually a protocol, even though you will hear people say, "Oh, you're going to use an Ames protocol." It's like, well, it's not necessarily a protocol. It's, it's there are protocols within Ames that are stand. So, uh, SMPTE 2022-6 was approved. Um, TR03 has been a, is is approved. Um, so, if you are an Ames Alliance member, then you're gonna support those. And now the other group, and I don't, is uh, is Aspen, where you can join as well. And it's there, it's, you are supporting it. You're supporting the Aspen protocol and you're building it into your stuff. Now, these are all the companies, as of going into NAB, this was everybody who was, who was on board with the Ames protocol. It's getting, to be, um, it's getting to be pretty much everybody at this point. And um, also I think uh, it's gonna be possible to have mixed protocols and some people have been talking about you know, are you, do you have to choose one or the other? I, I think a lot of, lot of systems are gonna support, are gonna support both. I know, um, you know, you could have one system running, you could have a system where you were running Aspen in the core, and then on the periphery it was Ames and Aspen. Um, so I mean, the, the good thing is that it, we seem to be getting to a point where it, it looks like this is gonna, this is gonna work out. And, and uh, you know, more, and there's live deployments of this and it's working. What uh, Panasonic did in that picture I had up there before was um, we created a gateway so that you could uh, get two studio cameras or four HD cameras and, and um, run those all into there and get, get those onto a giggy um, with, uh, with other guys supporting the same protocol. Now, one of the things that you can do if you're doing video over IP is um, is you can also support 4K. Because why, I think one of the reasons why folks are trying to do their infrastructure in video over IP is if they want to do 1080 60p, they can't use the same 3 gig SDI routers. They gotta buy, they gotta get, I mean they can't use the same 1.5 gig SDI routers, they gotta get 3 gig. Well if you're gonna get to 3 gig, you're probably gonna have to do something else again later. So like, do I want to buy three gig and spend millions of dollars and then come back and do 12 gig and spend it again? So like, you know what, let's go to IP and then if things change, uh, it's just a matter of adding bandwidth and, um, and changing the protocols, which is software. And uh, so to support 4K, what, uh, what a lot of folks are saying is, let's just do a four to one compression and then, then 4K will fit in the same bandwidth as, uh, as HD, because you can do pretty much lossless at, at four to one. And so for that, I mean, Panasonic joined the, the Tico Alliance, and these are just uh, uh, the last I checked all the people in the Tico Alliance. That's just a very fast, lightweight codec that will, that will take, that will take uh, 4K and fit it into an HD pipe. And actually that would work even in SDI, but uh, we're thinking about it more in terms of video over IP. And what we showed at NAB was, was this gateway. And so you've got two banks of, of uh, four SDIs and then corresponding 10 gig E output and sync and also sync. And so, and it's a one U unit. So if you've got a studio camera, say you've got a 4K studio camera and you wanna get that into a video over IP network, then you could just do your four jumpers up and then get your 10 gig E, so leave yourself an extra 1U rack space and, and you, can, you can upgrade to that. And then if anybody, and if somebody is doing the same protocols, uh, then, then this will go into, this could, this could go, just goes into a router, and then that can go into a, a video over IP server, or uh, another camera, or video IP switchers when they, when they become available, although those are actually starting to become available now. It's, uh, it, it's early on, although it's happening quickly, and there's a lot of lot of builds that are happening that are that are starting to use this now. Uh, we will have, uh, the plan is eventually to put these into cameras, 
and, um, and maybe even cameras like that. But I think, and cameras like this, at this part of the market, I really do believe people are gonna wanna use giggy rather than 10 giggy. All right, and, and that's all we got. Yes? Do you want anything with high dynamic range like HDR 10 or any of that? Yes. Yes, yes. What, what we're doing with HDR, and the biggest, the easy thing about HDR is actually getting the dynamic range because the, the imagers that we've been using have it. And in fact, the, the Varicam does HDR, and because we're shooting that in a log mode at uh, recording it at 12-bit, We've got plenty of room to get that dynamic range or the extended color gamut or all that. It's all in there, but it's a question of delivering it. Now, the, which gets to the, the difficult part. To deliver high dynamic range, we have to all agree on what the characteristic is on the monitor. And there's, uh, there's different versions out there that, that, are, that are being produced. There's hybrid log gamma, and then there's the, uh, the, the Dolby and uh, there's another one, I, another very popular one. Well, you're really talking about the EOTF. Or right, what the EOTF is, and, and um, for, for scripted production for high dynamic range, it's really not such a big deal because you just do another finish for it. In fact, we had a bunch of, of uh, we had a whole lot of demo footage we, we shot with Varicams a year and a half ago, and we just took the original raw log files and refinished them for HDR on the HDR monitors using like a color front or something. And it came out great because it was, it was already in there in the stock. So, um, so that, that actually is pretty good. And if, and if they change what they want to do or if another, another you know, transfer function comes along, you can just refinish it and do it when you've got the, the master in, in log or something that's already got the dynamic range. Do you support like 7086 or any of that? Yeah, well, we're looking at that too. It's, it, where it gets to be, where, where you really have to put a stick in the ground if you, if you want to do uh, live HDR. Because then everything has to be, then you have to fix everything at, at acquisition or, or near to it so that you can pass it all through the channel. And then you have to figure out how you're going to shade that. And, um, and whether you're going to change all the monitors to HDR or just a few monitors to HDR or just an HDR QC monitor or something like that. We have been doing testing with hybrid log gamma where the cameras will output hybrid log gamma and standard dynamic range simultaneously. So, and then return video is gonna be standard dynamic range because the viewfinders are not. And so we're looking at all these things about converting to standard dynamic range back up to high dynamic range and back and forth. There's gotta be a lot of flip, flip back and forth to make, to make the whole thing work. And, um, and we could really start nailing that down if everybody agreed on hybrid log gamma or, or something else like that. Um, the, but the, the saving grace of the whole thing is because it's just a transfer function, we can just flash it. You know, as soon as everybody says, this is gonna be the transfer function for high dynamic range for a broadcast, then we can just go and update our firmware and then we're good to go. So, you know, so we're not putting anything into the shipping product as it is now because we don't want to have to call everybody and say, hey, send all your cameras back. We want to change that characteristic to the, to the new one. Is there also an assumption that you need to support uh, HVC main 10 to be able to wrap that in and you don't have HVC yet? Or well, you know, I mean, if it's... If it's, well, no, we don't need that for the HEVC for delivery because we're not playing in that space. I mean, if it's, it's, if it's for edited, finished content, we're just going to continue to do it log because that'll work. And if it's live content, then, then it's going to all be baseband or, or just like a mezzanine compression. And so we won't need to do that until it gets to distribution. That could stop it from happening, but it, it's not. It's not like anything. We, it's not anything that we as camera guys have to deal with so far. All right. All right. Yeah, I want to see it happen. I mean, it, it's the best new thing I've seen since HD. Actually, no, since before HD. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like another SMPTE meeting uh, yeah, we can yeah. focus on. <clears throat>
Right, right. You, you'll never get leads approval on it. <laughs> yeah, well, that was actually one of the, one of the reasons why we, uh, why we stopped doing plasma, yeah. is that it was just too hard to meet the, to meet the, um, the, the energy requirements. In fact, actually, a plasma would have been an awesome high dynamic range monitor, but <laughs> it would have. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm. Yep. Well, it's, well, another nice thing is it's going to force everybody to go 10 bit. But yeah, I mean that's gonna. I mean that's already happening quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yes. <laughs> We're doing. I mean, in Japan. The, the the next generation of what's that, whatever after eight K. What what's the limiting factor as to where this can go? There's. Uh, when people stop paying, I think, is the limiting factor. Okay. All right. I think that's the main thing. And that might be sometime before 8K, in my opinion. Okay. But for, I'm going to think for movie house production. Well, that sort of I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being, um, I'm, I'm joking a little bit because there, I will tell you with 8K, um, 8K, 8K cameras do not have a low pass filter because the lens is a low pass filter. Mm -hmm. For 8K, but uh, you know it's it's I don't know I I I feel like we are starting just at NAB I felt like we were starting to get push you know we're starting to get pushback on 4K and um, 8K you know I don't know it's it, Japan seems bound and determined to do it but uh, that this uh, what I'm seeing around here is that a lot of the a lot of the uh, the shift is is to HD. People would more like to see HDR happen, even before 4K. I got to be careful though. I'm on camera here. Do you see for 8K, yeah. actually, there is one very very important application for 8K. It is um, almost necessary for as a delivery mechanism for uh, VR for a 360. Because if you're looking, because your, your, your 4K or your HD image, that's covering the full 360 field of view. So that means that the whatever 90 degrees that you're looking at is, isn't even, you know, it's like SD. You know? So if you go to, so if you can deliver VR at, uh, if you deliver VR at 8K, then you're going to actually see HD when you're looking <laughs> in your field of view. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I mean, I could see it as, it because even even in the even in with 8K delivery of VR, you're you're looking at, you know, it's like your face is pushed up against the glass, so you're you can see pixels. Another question: Metropolitan Opera is pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I think that's 720. But they <laughs> might be the people for 8K. But, it, but right now it's 720. Oh, yeah. Sports production. NFL. I seem to, I seem to be, they, they, there was something we saw at NFL a year or two ago where they were using a fixed camera and then picking up pieces of video out of that. So they didn't have to move the camera. They just moved oh, well, that's, the that's a whole other thing. And we actually showed, showed, um, uh, an application of that where we were just shooting with two 8K cameras and covering a whole field, right. and then just pulling a window out of that. I mean, if it if it reduces the amount of cameras you have to use, well, now it's you know now it's less so, money. So, so that's a good yeah. 8K over IP, so yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess could be important. Well, yeah. I mean, delivering that kind of a picture over IP is there's going to be uses for it. Yeah. Yeah. Capturing that picture, there's going to be use for it. But like, as a medium, right. you know, me, you know that, that that I think we get distracted by thinking about things as a medium. Because like 4K, 
if if 4K never if if a frame of 4K is never broadcast in this country, we will still use 4K all over the place. It's going to be really useful. And I think I think it's fair to say that the same should be true for 8K. Yeah. 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 We are, our cinema cameras are all 4096, yeah. 4K, 4K. But the broadcast stuff. But the broadcast stuff is quad HD, I'll say, you, or U, UHD. There's sort of a loose, and this isn't really official, but there's sort of a a, a, U, a loose nomenclature where UHD refers to quad HD, you know, 1080p times four, and then 4K is. 4K that's been around from films, film scans, it's 4096 across. So which one are you actually using when you're talking 4K? It depends on the camera. It depends on the camera. So broadcast so will be UHD. Broadcast will be UHD. Yeah, so br broadcast, the broadcast cameras are, are, uh, are UHD. Uh, all the, the cinema camera, the camcorders, the cinema cameras, uh, Varicams, DVX200, those are all 4096. Mo all of these, okay, so the, the FTP for sending pictures back and forth, for sending clips back and forth, Hi, Rose. can either go through the cloud or, or it, can go, it can go direct. Um, it's, uh, the, and camera control can either go direct or through the cloud. And, and the streaming can either go direct or through the cloud. What it, it's, so it's not, it's not a limitation of what, what you're moving, it's, it's how you choose to move. If you're doing FTP up to the cloud, that means everybody can see all the clips that are up there and then, and then they need to download. And in fact, the, the usual use case is the proxies all go up to the cloud and everyone can see them and you can pull it up and see them on your cell phone and stuff. But then when it comes time to bring the high res stuff, that goes direct from the camera to your server. So you don't have an upload and a download, it, it speeds it up. Okay, when, well, well it's, it's with an FTP, it's, it's FTP. It just goes to an so, FTP server. I, I, can, I can explain. You mean a, um, well, it's not a protocol. The, the, the protocol, it's not a protocol, it's a clip. It's just a file. And the FTP is just the file transfer. So when that clip comes in over the FTP, that is the same DVC Pro clip that you would have pulled off the card. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you use, if you you can go to, the, you can have, you can have those all upload to the cloud, and then you can just download it from there, yeah. from the browser. Yeah. That's possible too. And streaming too, yeah. And streaming, well, <clears throat> streaming doesn't go through the cloud at all. Streaming is direct. <clears throat> what what happens? It's think of it as a triangle. You know, you have your hard wire or your hard connection to the facility doing the live, you know, QoS. But <clears throat> what's going on in the cloud at that point is the camera management. So where you <clears throat> you can extract the thumbnails, you can uh, control the camera still, uh, paint and shade and. So that's more of control through the cloud. But yeah, the, the cloud is managing right. the connection, sort of. Yeah, I mean, it, there's not near enough bandwidth to actually stream to the, and, and the cloud is, it's Microsoft Azure is what we use our own application on, so it's uh, just. Uh, good question, the, I know the PTZs will multicast, I don't think the, I don't these think, are. Yeah, I don't think the camcorders will multicast. Well, multicast. You'd have to hop to somewhere else. Yeah. It'd be a couple of step pro. I mean, you could set it up with a with a provider, but it'd be a little complicated. Multicast. 
QoS case. Uh, uh, yeah, <coughs> good point. Yeah, you, yeah, you'd have to have yeah, the QoS go somewhere. But yeah, uh, no, it could. Two <coughs> might be no, I there. think that's a valid point. It just so there can only be one receiver with QoS. Yeah. Right, but it, will the yeah. will will P two cast pick up? It, it won't pick up QoS. See, because that that might be a, a. I mean, it could be made to do that. You could have P two cast decode the QoS and then forward it to your CDN. <clears throat> but the camera would be adjusting for this point and not adjusting for oh, that Oh, no, point. no, but that's okay though, because it, the, the QoS is just from here to here for that network, and then that's gonna change, that's gonna flip it to like a, to a, uh, like an MPEG dash or something, which is gonna adjust it, which is a separate oh, kind of, like a reverse the QoS, yeah. The stream of the camera got to be the best Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.